Welcome to Got It Work, another episode. It's going to be a little bit different this time. Rather than traveling off to some particular country, we're going to be looking at revivals from different eras and different stages in different countries around the world. Um, but it's been a passion of mine for a long time to study revivals. And so let's take a look and see some of the keys that I have noticed throughout reading dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens of books on the subject. It's just been a passion of mine and it's something I want here in my life, in my city, and in my country. And consequently, I was doing everything I could to find out more and more about it. So we're going to start out with a song with Jerry, one that I just love because it's talking about changing the world. And that's exactly what a revival does, change the world. You can't change the stormy weather You can't change the sands of time You can't change the rugged mountain So it's easier to climb But you can change somebody's life Just by giving them your own One by one will change the world so come on, sing this song You can change yourself, it might take a little while You can change your friends just by giving them a smile You can change the world and we've got so little time To chase away the darkness and fill the world with light You can't stop the rain from falling You can't stop the ocean's tide You can't stop the sun from shining Even if you try You can change yourself But you can stop that empty feeling You can change the world Of being all alone Just put love in someone's life You'll find love is in your own You can change yourself It might take a little while You can change your friends Just by giving them a smile You can change the world And we've got so little time To chase away the darkness And fill the world with light Yes, you can change yourself It might take a little while you can change your friends just by giving them a smile You can change the world and we've got so little time To chase away the darkness and fill the world with light Yes, we can change the world and we've got so little time To chase away You can change the world And that's a little bit of what I'm looking at today You know, a lot of us have had hearts longing to see more of God. You know, probably if I asked right now, if we were together and I asked you, how many of you would love to see a revival here in, in your life, in your church, in your city? Probably the large percentage of you would raise your hands. It's been a longing, my heart's desire for so many years. Many years ago, back in about the 80s, I started having such a hunger and a longing for more and more of God. I'd come to a point I wasn't satisfied with things just the way they were. I wanted more. You know, I, I read constantly in the Bible all these things that God did, the way Jesus moved and touched and healed and raised the dead and saw captives set free. And, and I would read how it said that we are to do the same and even greater things. And I thought, well, why am I not seeing this? If we're to do greater things, why am I not seeing even these things, let alone greater things? 
and I started passionately seeking out everything I could find on revivals. Everything I could find, every book I could get my hold of, hands on to grab hold of, I did. I, I wanted it so badly. And I read on the revivals from all over, the, all over the world, I read on them. And I had an opportunity to go down to Argentina where one of the revivals was going on and starting. And, you know, I see so many people that run all over the world looking for revivals, wanting to be a part of the revival. Well, my desire wasn't so much to be a part of that revival. Yes, I wanted to be immersed in it. It was a wonderful thing, but I wanted it more to see what was going on, to see what was lacking. I was studying and studying the revivals. I started looking incredibly for finding out what was happening when a revival broke forth. And I, I knew there had to be some common threads going on. And I started searching for them in every one of the books I've read. And I've read many, many, many books. I actually have one that was never even published. The author died before the manuscript even went, went to publisher, to print. So I mean, everything I could find. I've spent hours talking with people that have been really involved with revivals and anything I could because I wanted more. There was just that passion burning within me. I so wanted more. I wasn't satisfied with just things the way things were. I remember one night before one of my trips to Argentina, actually, I was praying and I thought, God, I've got to see something different. I'm tired of going halfway around the world to see you move with such power, with such consistency, where a move of your spirit, where the miraculous is the norm rather than the rare exception. Yes, by then I'd seen blind eyes healed and I'd seen things happen, but not where it was the everyday norm, only where it, it happened once or here or there, but I wanted it to be the norm. I wanted it to be a regular part of my life, of my church, of my ministry, and I wasn't going to settle for anything less. So I started looking in all of these books for the common thread that would weave throughout them, things that took place leading up to that revival. And I found many, but then I also wanted to know what took place when those revivals that fires that were burning hot all of a sudden started to dwindle and started to die and started to completely wane out. Why? Why did these revivals that were so wonderful die? And I looked for those common threads. So I looked for things that took place leading up to the revivals and I looked to things that took place as they started to die. And I didn't want to just see a revival. I wanted it to be a part of my life. And I wanted to be able to live out the years that I had left, whether it was 5, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years, it didn't matter. I wanted to live out those years with a move of the Spirit all around. I didn't want just to have an exciting time for a year and then have it gone or just live that same level over and over and over and over again. So it's like living the same year, just repeating it. She'd like in that little old movie Groundhog Days where the guy repeated the same thing day after day after day. I don't want to go through that. I wanted things to keep getting better and more and, and more of the move of the Spirit, more healings taking place, more lives changed, more captives set free. And I know that was something that he wanted. So I kept looking for it and studying it. And in studying some of the revivalists, I found some quotes that I just loved. Like Duncan Campbell, who was really involved in, in the Hebrides Revival, Lewis Island in Scotland, back in 1949-ish to 52. And I thought, God, I want to know. And I, I studied all sorts of things on him. And one of the things that he made a comment of, he said, you must win people to yourself first before you could expect to win them for the Lord. And the way to achieve this is by practical demonstration of kindness and godliness. When they see you speaking one thing and living something completely different, 
They're not really going to want what you have if they can't see truth and reality in it. If they see you talking about this, but living in this way, they're going to say, where's the truth? Where's the reality? Another revivalist, his name was Robert Layton. And at one point he was being accused of by other ministers of not speaking to the social and political issues of his day. He was being accused of just being, you know, living life day to day as it was and not speaking to any of these issues. And he said, when so many are speaking to the times, permit one poor brother to speak for eternity. He was more interested in what eternity had in store than the daily little issues that were going on. And Duncan Campbell, he said another quote that I, I really liked. He said, the desire for revival is one thing. The desire for revival is one thing. Confident anticipation that our desire will be fulfilled is another. And a lot of times we have that desire. We're crying out for it. We're longing for it. But are we willing to do whatever it takes to see that revival break forth. Duncan Campbell, at one point, he was invited to speak up in the Hebrides when things were just starting to burst forth and escalate. And he told them he couldn't. He told them he wouldn't be there because he had a prior commitment down in London at a very large church and ministry in London. So he told them he wouldn't make it. And these two old ladies in their 80s, they started to pray. And they were fervently praying, God, we know that you have called us to invite Duncan to come up here for this time. And Father, we ask that you will do whatever it takes to see that situation change so that he will be here. And as he was walking up the stairs in this church in England, he was walking up and the Lord said, what are you doing here? And Duncan said, I'm coming to do this meeting for you, Lord. And he said, who asked you to do this meeting? And Duncan responded, well, the pastor invited me. And he said, I didn't send you. I was sending you to the Hebrides. And you turned it down. So Duncan went in and he told the pastor, look, I cannot do this meeting. I have to go. I have to go. I have to go in obedience to what God is asking of me. And he headed up to the Hebrides. And there were so many things going on. There was one man, he was a blacksmith. He wasn't a minister, wasn't in any position in his congregation. He was a blacksmith. And he wanted more of God. He wanted to see a move of the Spirit. And his name was John, and he was asked to pray at one meeting and he said, oh God, you made a promise to pour water upon that that is thirsty, upon him that is thirsty and floods upon dry ground. And Lord, it's not happening. And then he paused and he waited and then he prayed on. Lord, I don't know how the ministers stand, but I stand before thee as an empty vessel, longing and thirsting for thee and for the manifestation of thy power <clears throat> oh God, your honor is at stake, and I now ask you to fulfill your covenant engagement and do what you've promised to do. And right at that very moment, as he was praying, the house where he was shook. Dishes rattled, and wave after wave of the divine power swept through the building. Just swept through it completely. And Duncan felt that Acts 4 had been reenacted and had, when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they had assembled together and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. Duncan felt that that was a reenactment of Acts 4. But also at that time among those who had been converted was a young 15 year old boy. And in one meeting, the Lord saw, Duncan saw the Lord moving on this young fellow. His name was Donald, and he asked Donald to pray. And he prayed in reference to Revelations 4, which he had read that morning, and said, Oh God, I seem to be gazing through the open door. I see the Lamb in the midst of the throne, with the keys of death and hell at his girdle. 
And then lifting his eyes toward heaven, he cried, Oh God, there is power. There, let it loose here. And with the force of a hurricane, the Spirit of God swept into the building, and the floodgates of heaven opened. The church resembled a battlefield. On one side were many prostrate over their seats, weeping and sighing. On the other side, there were some that were affected by throwing their arms in the air in a rigid posture. God had come and was touching these lives. And sometimes, you know, you see things, you think it looks so strange, but we've got to be very careful how we judge or how we look at it. There were some things that happened that, I mean, I knew were not of God. There were other things that were still very strange and I wasn't really comfortable with, but I knew God was moving in it. And it was like after I had prayed that one time, God, I want to see you move with such power and such consistency as I saw every time I went to Argentina. And so this night before traveling down there, I made this prayer, God, I want to see you move in my life, in my church, in my city, in my country with such consistency. And if I don't start to see things change, God, I want out. I don't want to play church anymore, Father. I want that real move of you, of your spirit in our midst. And things started to happen. Actually, from when I was returning from Argentina, nobody knew down there what my prayer had been before leaving. And as I was heading to the airport, I had to stop at the church to do one more service. They had services 24 hours a day at that time. And I was, I was doing four, five, six services a day sometimes. But this was my last service before heading to the airport. And I was walking out to preach when they, when they called me out. And the two main pastors pointed out, as if they'd planned it in unison, pointing at me. Just pointing, one after the other. And, whew, and they said, Rana, God said to tell you he's heard your heart's cry. From this moment, uh, your life, your church, your ministry, your city will never be the same. And so I was on the plane on the way back, writing out my sermon notes. And when I got to the church, I was already late because my flight had been delayed. And being that I had a church that had an outreach to the poor, to the homeless, to the alcoholic, to the drug addicts, it was so well-known in seeker-sensitive churches. The sermon can't be longer than this because they can't take anything longer and there can only be this amount of music and there can only be this long a meeting. And I walked in and I had my sermon notes in hand and I was walking up to the pulpit and God said, put down your notes. I said, but God, this is the message that you gave me and I'm just heading up to preach it. He said, yes, it's a message I gave you, but it's not for now. Put down your notes. And I am like, but God, and he said, I told you that things will change. Now, are you going to let me out of the box that you've put me in and let me be God? Are you going to let me out of that box and let me be God? Oh, yeah, Lord, God, forgive me. And I threw down my notes and I headed forward. And I saw things change. I saw things take place. Some that I wasn't comfortable with. But when I knew God was in it, I had to make a choice to become uncomfortable in me and my ways and what I was doing or to be obedient to God. And I knew that it had to be related to some of these keys that I had been reading on. And Duncan Campbell, another one of my favorite ones to quote, he said, revival must ever be related to holiness. True revival is a revival of holiness. He believed that personal holiness is more desirable than happiness, that it is not in heaven alone that God wants our saintliness. It is here and now that holiness is not just a doctrine to be taught. It is a way of life. It is the life of Jesus. But, you know, Duncan, he made comments, you know, he says, 
God's not expecting any of us to be perfectly saintly here on earth. That's not going to happen. But he wants us to aim for the best that we can and make short order if there's sin to get rid of it as quick as possible. And this one guy came up to Duncan one time and he said, and he heard hearing this, he, Duncan heard this man boasting about how he had not sinned for 40 years. And Duncan replied, well, brother, you've just broken your record. Bragging and being arrogant about it and making the comments, you know, that he didn't sin in 40 years. And Duncan, you just broke your record. But noting through all of these studies, I found some of the common keys to the past revivals. And a revival is not all of the, you know, airy fairy tales that you hear of some of these things. And um, I'm not going to mention any of the ones that I have, I have trouble with because I know some of the things have been God, but not all of them by any means. And when one person that was involved in a revival that was going on made a comment that he got this from Argentina, and I called him up, I knew the fellow, and I said, tell me where in Argentina did you get this? Where in Argentina did you see people walking like crabs and roaring like roosters and doing such and such? I said, if you said God gave it to you for this or that or whatever, that's one thing. But to say you got this in Argentina and that's why you're bringing it here. Uh-uh. I said, I have been down to Argentina. and that point, I'd been there over 30 times. And I said, I have never, and I've been to many of the churches, pretty well all of the churches that were involved in the revival that was going on down there. You can't blame that on Argentina. And he said, well, I just thought. I said, we're not looking for your thought. We're looking for obedience to God and to the things of the Spirit. So people are not satisfied with what they've got. and They're looking for more. They're not willing to remain where they're at spiritually. They want more. I want more. I still want more. And I've been, you know, in many, many countries and seen revivals in different forms and shapes in many countries. But I want more. I'm not satisfied. So many people get involved in a revival that they see going on around them, and they become satisfied with that rather than desiring more, rather than looking for more of what God has, they become stagnant with that. There are people, some that I know personally, that have traveled all over the world looking for revival, believing that revival will give them the keys to their city. It doesn't work that way. I can tell you there's principles that I have seen in these different revivals that have helped, principles that can, can work, but what God gives one pastor as a key for a revival in his city could be completely different than what God gives you for yours. You know, for example, when I was pastoring the Westminster Foursquare Church, it was really kind of interesting because we had a real move of the Spirit going on and lives were being touched. We had this a very small church, but we had a large outreach to the homeless, to the addicts, to the drug addicts, to the prostitutes. And other pastors from around the city, from different churches, started calling up and asking if they could come to see what we were doing because they saw the move of God going on and they wanted it. And I had several come. One that was maybe was particularly funny from somebody up in the British property area you know, a very wealthy area of the city that figured having this outreach to the poor, to the homeless, was the key for revival. And so he started an outreach to the homeless, the addicts, to the prostitutes up in his area. Do you think his neighbors were very pleased with that? No. They got so mad, they tried to get the city to shut the guy down. But that wasn't the key for him. He needed to find out with the demographics in his area, what is the need? How can I meet the needs of these people? What is their greatest need? For some, maybe it's an area where there's a lot of single mothers, and that's what they need. For others, maybe it's an area where there's a lot of elderly, and they need some type of ministry and outreach to the elderly to see something break forth. But Duncan said, revival is neither more nor less 
be then the impact of the personality of Jesus Christ upon a church or upon an individual life. The impact of the personality of Jesus on your life, on what the people see in your life, will impact their lives, their areas, more than any eloquent sermon that you can preach. When God asked me to have the outreach to the homeless and the poor, I was a little upset. But God, you know, I've done this and I've got this and I've done that. And, you know, most of these people don't even have elementary school education, let alone university. And, you know, I was grumbling to God. You got the wrong person for this. And God said, I have put you where I need you to be. And putting you there, I know that you will learn you have to rely on me. Because if I put you in one of these churches, you would think that you could do it in your own strength. But you need to know that it's going to be your reliance on who I am and what I am capable of, not who you are. But in some of the revivals of the past, some of the keys that I found, one, I'm going to give you four of them. One of them was conviction of sin. When people really came to a place, they wanted nothing more than to see God move in their lives and in their midst. They came to the understanding and the realization that our God is a consuming fire. And when revival draws near, so does the fire. Believe me, you come to that point where you truly want to see God move in that consistency. You better know that you're going to be hit hard. It's going to happen. There is a conviction of sin. Henry Black is a, was a Scotchman, an author on different revivals. He spent a lot of time traveling with different revivalists, and Duncan Campbell was one of them. But in his book called Revival, he said, There is a conviction of sin deep, terrible, and inescapable, not a matter of sins that you particularly choose to think about, you know, choose to examine, but the sins that are brought before you by the power of the Holy Spirit. You need to deal with those, he said. You can either alter the revelation that God's showing you, and you can justify, is this from God or is this just me, etc., etc., or you can choose to deal with it, and you accept the divine verdict on your condition and the sin that is in your life. And let God change. Let God change you. Let him deal with whatever is holding you back from receiving all that God has. And then you will see your life changed, your church changed, your community changed. And not just if you're the pastor. No, it takes everybody in that community when you are concerned with your own sin and shortcomings, nothing else matters. God draws near, and there comes the burning fire and the conviction of that sin. The second one that I saw through all of them, you know, people would recognize sin, and so often today when we recognize something, we try and hide it, and we try and, you know, deal with, okay, God, forgive me, you know, but don't let anybody find out about it. But in these different studies on revivals that I did, to you know I found when people found something, they so desperately wanted to be free. And the conviction, you know, in their lives would become so intense that the people just felt compelled to get rid of it, to get it out. And if they wanted to share it with somebody to get help, to pray through it, to be set free, they will because he didn't want to hinder anything from that move of God. In revival, sin is brought to the surface. People can't hold it back. They can't stand it. They are desperate to be done with it, to be clean, to be clear under the strong pressure of God. You would find it there, and I have seen this in so many places, there would be conviction about relationships, about attitudes, sin in general. And God would call the immediate surrender, immediate obedience, and immediately breaking. And after God did the, the breaking, then there would come the flood of salvation. 
Charles Finney was a great revivalist in the 1800s in this, in, in this, in, and he had a theory, you know, like when planting a garden, if you're going to sow seeds, you've got to break up the fallow ground. And he talked a lot about breaking up the fallow ground, the hard soil in our own lives, that we had to break it up, taking care of any of the things that were causing these issues. And then if we would sow seeds then, when we had plowed up, the, broken up the fallow ground, then we would sow seeds and they would be able to take root. And then we would reap the harvest. Then we would see things taking place. But Finney, he knew that it would yield no harvest if they just sowed the seeds on hardened ground, on unbroken ground. But then when the farmer breaks that fallow, ground, then the farmer sows seeds in faith, expecting to reap a harvest. And it's like with us too. We have got to break up the fallow ground doing whatever it takes if we want to sow seeds and see that spiritual harvest. So we've got to receive whatever it can. Finney actually did a list, and I'm not going to go through them all now. It would take way too long but he did a list of what he would call the sins of commission and then he did another list the sins of omission the sins of commission were things like pride and envy and all this type of thing slander and things that we needed to take care of in our lives and then the things of omission were things like a lack of love for god uh ingratitude, neglect of the Bible, unbelief, and all those type of things. Neglect of really truly believing in the power of God, and a neglect of a, a love for lost souls. And But as these things were dealt with, then he saw multitudes seeking and desiring to know what was happening. It brought one of the greatest revivals that America has ever seen. Again, in the book by Hugh Black, called Revival. It states that Finney started to preach. When he did, there were about 600,000 Christians in America. And when he finished, there were over 6 million. Finney had been God's instrument for many of those 6 million. Then another revivalist, Evans Roberts with the Welsh Revival, he talked about that there are conditions that must be met and we too must come face to face with these conditions and we will need to come to a place not merely of academic interest but of positive action that's one thing when i was doing this study on all of these revivals i didn't want it just to be some academic chore that i was doing but i wanted it to bring fruit and one of the things that Evans Roberts said, he says, if there's any sin in your past that you have not confessed to God, get on your knees now at once. And Roberts would be right there. Get on your knees now. And he'd be see people all over the room, all over the meeting, falling to their faces, weeping before God. And then he said, if there's anything in your life that is doubtful, have you forgiven everybody that you need to forgive? Everybody? If not, don't expect forgiveness for your own sins. You won't find it. And then Evans, he also said, do what the Spirit prompts you to do. Obedience. Prompt, implicit, unquestioning obedience to God. God is expecting our obedience. He's not just looking for us to hear him and say, oh yeah, God is showing me this, God is saying this. But he's looking for us to hear and obey. And that obedience has got to come from trusting him. Trust the Holy Spirit and obey him implicitly. And fourthly, Evans Roberts, he listed a very uh, well-known and common part, a public confession of Christ as your Savior. And with those steps following, being followed through, Evan Roberts, he found people saved in masses. He saw rights, wrongs being righted. He saw people going and requesting something to take place that would see a right wrong. Someone, one person 
that had stolen quite a large sum of money, especially for that time, went to the person and said, look, I don't have every penny of this right now, but I want to pay you back every penny, and here's my first installment. When I was pastoring the church in New West, um, there was a young fellow that had nowhere to live, and he asked if he could come and stay at our house for a while, and I said, sure, you know, and he came to live with us, and all of a sudden, he, he disappeared. I found checks that had been mailed, because at that time we didn't have an office, so church mail came to my house, and I found checks, envelopes that disappeared. Someone would phone and say, hey, have you got my check yet? No, and then all of a sudden, I realized what was going on. But not only was he stealing mail, he stole one of my credit cards, and he ran it up to over the credit limit. He ran it up and left me with a $10,000 debt. I was a single mother at the time. I didn't have $10,000. Well, actually, I had just remarried, and we didn't have $10,000 at that point. But it was crazy what happened. He ended up in jail, not because of that. I was going to report it, and God said, no, don't, because it's going to, you're going to need to have a relationship with him as things happen down the road. So anyways, the next thing you know, a couple of years later, he showed up at the church again for the free dinner. And um, he came up to me. And he said, uh, Pastor Brana, I've got nowhere to stay tonight. Will you allow me back at your house? And I looked at him. And I said, you know that I know what happened before you disappeared. And I said, the money wasn't the worst part of it. What you stole from the church, you stole from God. And I said, a check wouldn't do you any good anyways. I got most of those back actually because he threw them in a garbage dump behind, dumpster behind where he was working. And someone that was dumpster diving found him and called me. And um, I said, what you stole that painting, you'll never know the value of it. And what you would have got for it at a pawn shop was nothing. But it was a gift to me by the Ashanti king when I lived in Ghana. And its sentimental value had probably far greater value to me than the monetary value, although it was worth a lot of money. And he looked at me, he said, well, would you allow me to come and stay at your house again? And I tell you, I can't say that I was really holy and oh sure no problem everything in me wanted to say no no way you're not coming back to my house and yet God said tell him yes he and he in the meantime he said it won't be for long I just need somewhere to go and um, so that was fine as I said yes the next thing you know he put his hand in his pocket and he pulled out a wad of bills. And I mean a big wad of bills. And he placed it in my hand. And he said, this is my initial payment of what I owe you. There's not much left, but I will pay every penny plus interest because I know you'd be charged interest. And he said, I was waiting to see how you would respond. I was waiting to see if you really believed what you preached that old things are passed away, all things are become new. Were you willing to believe what you preach? And when you said yes, I know that was hard for you, but I want to make things right. Here's the money. And so when things like this happen, you know, and the revivalists you saw it in all of they would find a great reaping of things going on. People were saved in masses. And Evans talked about how there was magistrates with no cases to judge, pubs that were emptied, and halls of iniquity, as he said, that were emptied. Foul language, you never, no longer heard it. And it was amazing what God did. But then there was also some characteristics throughout all of these revivals. And I, I can't go through them all right now, but I want to give you a few of the keys when a revival was 
dying and why. Some of the th things, the commonalities that I found. And some of these things, they really saddened me because they were what led usually to the death or the waning of a revival. In many of the cases, when the principal individual involved died, others around them were satisfied with things they were at. You know, for an assistant pastor in the midst of a huge revival, he's satisfied with things where they're at. But he doesn't have the vision that the initial pastor had. And so they would settle for less. Other times, even though the revivalist was still around, that insatiable longing for more and the willingness to do whatever it took diminished and whatever was necessary to see the revival continue to burn brightly no longer existed. And they too became satisfied with what they already had. And then there were those situations when the people became fixated with the revival itself rather than what was God was doing. It's like they lost sight of the God of the revival. One of the key figures in the Argentinian revival, his name was Carlos Anacondia. And um, I was talking with him one time and I said, Carlos, why do you feel that some of these things with the revival that were happening aren't happening to the same degree now? What do you feel is the key? And he looked at me with tears in his eyes. And Carlos was a really short young guy. Not young, he's my age, but he was short. And uh, he looked at me and he said, the people that are the key figures in the revival, because this was in Argentina and things had started to dwindle. And he said, the people that were the key figures, rather than fanning the fire of that revival, they were more interested in traveling the world to speak about the revival than see the revival carry on. And in talking with some dear friends of mine down there, they will say that is exactly what happened. But one of my friends, a um, good friend, Pastor Hector Jimenez, I asked him about it, and that was what he said, and he realized that he had become more interested, rather than training up disciples that had the same vision for revival that could carry it on with or without him, he had become more fixated on traveling to do big meetings to speak on the revival than to live the revival and see the revival carry on and grow. And I know that we've got to come to that point where nothing is going to satisfy us other than the move of God, the complete move of God, that we're willing to do whatever it takes to see our lives right before him, where we're willing to become more like Jesus. And I'm just going to ask Jerry if he'll finish with this song for me called More Like Jesus. It's a song that is my heart's cry. It's saying, Lord, you know, get, get rid of my pride and my vanity. Lord, help me to just live as you would have me live. I need to be more like you, Lord. I want to be more. I need to be more like you. So, Jerry, could you go ahead and play this just before I close in prayer? Thank you. These things that hinder me Take my pride and my vanity Help me understand you Teach me how to love you Won't you help me to be more I want to be more I need to be more like you, Lord, 
I want to be more, I need to be more like you Ooh, Take myself and hypocrisy Let me live in simplicity Help me burn my bridges and live your word within me. Lord, please help me to be more, more, more. I want to be more. I need to be more like you, Lord. I want to be more. I need to be more, 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 more. I want to be more. I need to be more like you. I want to be more, I need to be more like you Take my heartache and emptiness Deliver me from all worldly Take the chains that bind me Put your arms around me And then please help me To be more, more, more I want to be more I need to be more like you, Lord I want to be more I need to be more More, more, more I want to be more I want to be more, I need to be more like you, Lord. I want to be more, I need to be more, 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 more. How I want to be more, I need to be more like you, Lord. I want to be more, I need to be more like you. Well, thank you for joining us today, and um, I hope it's been a blessing for you. And if it's touched you and you would like to sow into this ministry, please feel free to do so. Jerry will put the instructions up onto the screen as to how you can do it and the, the best ways to go about. The e-transfer is only for those in Canada. The other one, anybody can use. Okay, thank you very much for being with us. We'll see you next week. God bless you. <music>